Welcome back, word nerds. Mike here with The Social Life of Language, making complex theory simple but never simplified. If you think that sounds cool, hit that subscribe button now. Today, we'll be looking at a chapter from the book, Language in the Trump Era, edited by Janet McIntosh and Norma Mendoza Denton. And we'll be looking at Janet McIntosh's chapter entitled Crybabies and Snowflakes, as in that super popular right-wing accusation of liberals supposedly crying about everything. Now, it's tempting to focus on how that's pretty silly coming from the outrage machine, but, Instead, we're gonna focus on how language has real effects on the world. Meaning, when language is in real world context, it can carve out groups of people or position groups into hierarchical arrangements, especially in contexts where there's a powerful institution involved or a powerful person. So how does that happen? Let's find out. We can first take a look at another short piece also included in this book, this one written by Norma Mendoza Denton. And here they look at the word the. Yeah, the. This word can assist in carving out groups of people. It can even assign you to being either inside a group or outside a group. I'll give you an example. If I say Hispanics are awesome, I could be including myself in that group or not. Also, a non-Hispanic person can say that relatively unproblematically. Now, if I say the Hispanics are awesome, suddenly it becomes likely that I'm not actually in the group I'm talking about. It's more like I'm talking about a them, the Hispanics. That word the effectively drew a box around this group of people, and it draws boxes around lots of groups of people. For example, the gays, the blacks, the Hispanics, the Democrats. When I talk like that, it sounds like I'm making sure that you don't confuse me for being actually a part of that group. And also, it's making sure that you know those groups exist. That is building reality through language. This is just one way that tiny social divisions emerge. Sometimes they can emerge through little words, but sometimes it's highly visible when it happens. If I were to say white people, then I were to say the whites. You know that I am not in there. I'm talking about this other group that I'm not a part of. And well, Trump is pretty notorious for using this linguistic technique. We won the evangelicals. We won with poorly educated. I love the poorly educated. 46% with the Hispanics, 46%. I have a great relationship with the blacks. I have, I've always had a great relationship with the blacks. The blacks, ah, some of my best friends are black. Oh, you people, oh, that one. So now that we see that language in context can create social groups, let's talk about Macintosh's article, which is about creating that group often referred to in right-wing media as crybabies and snowflakes. So we've been talking about how language is not just to describe things. As in the word tree represents the thing tree. Language does that, but not only that. Or as Macintosh says, language does things and it can be mobilized to reshape social relations. Just like the idea of a snowflake. When you use the word snowflake, you will probably take up a stance or an attitude towards something. For example, let's say I'm in a coffee shop and I call someone a snowflake. They could perceive me as taking up a conservative stance. See, that insult pushed that person into a defensive stance. And just like that, we are building the reality of that coffee shop. In other scenarios, the word snowflake could be perceived as highly moralistic because when I call somebody a snowflake, I'm implying that they need to grow up. I'm the grown up, you're the kid. And just like that, I took up a stance of superiority, which depending on the other person, they might perceive themselves as being pushed into an inferior position. Again, 
language has acted upon the world. Still, in other scenarios, me using the word snowflake when paired with what I look like, big ass beard, rippy t-shirts, that is typically read as hyper-masculine. So putting all those signs and messages together could send the message, I'm a tough guy, you're a sensitive little girl. That is a hierarchical stance that brings in gender. Again, let's say it together. Language, Language acts, acts upon, upon the world. The world. So insults like crybaby and snowflake embed stances. Stances toward morality, stances toward the idea of toughness or sensitivity, etc., etc. In this article, Macintosh is gonna analyze how all these stances come together and interact within this snowflake conversation. And she also traces a historical line about the snowflake idea that is not only a masculine stance, but also a highly militaristic stance. So the author did her research among a bunch of Army and Marine Corps veterans, as well as Marine Corps drill instructors. And what she found was that the snowflake insult resonated with basic training and boot camp rites of passage, specifically that drill instructors wanted to create tough, callous individuals, especially through name calling, such as the word crybaby, snowflake, buttercup, pussies, but also simply lady and girl. I am Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, your senior drill instructor. If you ladies leave my island, if you survive recruit training, you will be a minister of death praying for war. But until that day, you are not even human fucking beings. But the more you hate me, the more you will learn. I am hard, but I am fair. There is no racial bigotry here. I do not look down on niggers, kites, wops, or greasers. How tall are you, Private? Sir, five foot nine, sir! Five foot nine? I didn't know they stacked shit that high. Where in hell are you from anyway, Private? Sir, Texas, sir! Holy dog shit! Texas, only steers and queers come from Texas, private cowboy! And you don't much look like a steer to me, so that kind of narrows it down. Macintosh calls this semiotic callousing. So an overall callousing. A person should not react in any way. They should be completely unfazed. Because they are tough men. Yes, men. As in, ultra-masculine. For example, Macintosh has a conversation with a drill instructor who says, what are they going to give these Marines at graduation? A dress? But then it's a whole generation of entitled liberal snowflakes. So this snowflake idea makes it possible to frame anyone that reacts to anything as being overly sensitive, which has been weaponized by conservative media and conservative politicians and if you think you know what is better for someone, well then everything they say has no legitimacy. Or, as Macintosh says, the crybaby snowflake discourse thus clarifies the stance of the speakers toward their targets. We are not in conversation. And unless and until you change, you are not worth listening to. I think that Tammy Lauren person pretty much embodies the conservative stance designed to delegitimize almost anyone. Let's see her in action. So what is a snowflake? Well, allow me to explain. If you occupy the streets in protests more frequently than you occupy a shower or a job, you're a snowflake. If choosing between two gender options seems unfair to you, you are a snowflake. If you think you, by virtue of being born, deserve a participation trophy, you are a snowflake. If you think borders, walls, and immigration laws are mean, you are a snowflake. It's time to wake up and realize you are special to your parents, not anyone else. You need to get over the notion that the worst thing that can happen to you is hurt feelings. You know, I guess. Now, liberals are trying to reclaim this snowflake idea, as in... Liberals have started throwing this crybaby idea back at conservatives, but I don't think this snowflake reclamation is gonna go very far. Because remember, language can act through stance taking, and the snowflake insult potentially embeds a whole lot of stances we've been talking about, whether we want our language to embed those stances or not. So that's just my unsolicited opinion that nobody cares about. 
But are we really having the conversation when we call out the right-wing media's supreme snowflakery? Honestly, at this point, I don't really see it as trying to win a rational argument. It's just more about who can dominate the next person while they're yelling at each other. The snowflake insult acts upon the world. It creates and enforces social hierarchy. It divides up the world and it solidifies the boundaries between particular social groups. So one major lesson here is that language is not just a bunch of words representing things in the world. When language is put into context, it performs action. It builds reality. By the way, do go check out my conversation with Norma Mendoza Denton, who is the other editor of Language in the Trump Era. We talk about a bunch of stuff, like the Access Hollywood tapes, how gender ideologies get mixed up with the way we talk about military weapons. Bunch of crazy stuff. Click up in the corner to go check that out. And that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to look me up on academia.edu for all my current publications. And of course, you can support this channel through Patreon. This is Mike with The Social Life of Language, and we're done.